Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, our jet stream pattern, not only today, but over the next couple of weeks, is going to be highly amplified like you see it here. The jet stream coming out of the North Pacific is building into a large ridge across the west coast of the United States before dipping into a deep trough that extends down into parts of Texas. This ridge that you see here has elevated the fire threat across much of California. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds because the Santa Ana winds will be will be going with this pattern. But what I want you to notice on the other side of the mountains is that within this trough, you can see that the strong winds kind of come in like this, and then they get slowed down here at the base of the trough. This is perfect upper level dynamics and then accelerate out on this side. We will probably have this piece of the jet stream bridge with this cutting off this low sitting in this area. And in addition to that, this jet streak, that's this pocket of fast moving winds that you see right in through here. Well, we like to divide jet streaks up into four quadrants like I'm doing. And right down here in this area, we have some upper level divergence. That's the right entrance regions of, region of that jet streak. And that is going to support the development of a low pressure system in that area. And you can see the low pressure system forming when I take you down to the surface winds. It's forming right in through this corridor. On one side of it, we're drawing in quite a bit of warm, moist air, and on the back side, quite a bit of colder air coming in. And that's actually going to increase our winter weather threat in parts of Texas, New Mexico, and southern Colorado today. But before I show you that, take a look at the stronger winds that are moving through southern California by the time we get into this afternoon. That is our Santa Ana wind, and it's coming out of the east. It goes over the Mojave Desert, rises up over the mountains in Southern California, and as it descends on the other side, it, well, it really, really dries out because of the adiabatic compression of the air. And when I tell you that it dries out, this is a humidity forecast, a relative humidity forecast for this afternoon. We will see throughout much of California our humidity values between 5 and 10%. That is extremely dry air. When we combine that with some stronger winds, we will see wind gusts today in the 30 to 40 mile an hour range in Southern California and also in the Sacramento Valley. We are increasing our fire threat dramatically. So we can see here, this is issued here uh, by the Storm Prediction Center. We have extreme fire threat in Southern California and a large region of the rest of California that is in elevated or critical uh, stages here. So we're gonna see this particular pattern one that produces fire threat in California emerging several times over the next 10 days as we look at the flow pattern as it evolves during that time. So it's no surprise that we have the red flag warnings, the high wind warnings in California. We also have those high wind warnings in parts of Montana as well, where we might see gusts today getting up above 60 miles an hour. Now, over the last 24 hours, we saw some upslope flow on the front range of the Rocky Mountains, and we still have through this morning winter weather advisories uh, through this area. And that is because we have already picked up several inches of snow on the front range, and we are anticipating quite a bit more with the system that's developing right in this area. But if you're already sick of the snow, don't worry. We do have some westerly winds that will be coming in here following this system, increasing the temperatures back up in the 60s on the front range. And if you all live, if anybody's watching this that lives there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we are watching this low that will be developing here. And on the back side of it, we do have winter weather problems that could be coming through northern Texas. And enough cold air sneaking back in through here that in West Texas we have hard freeze warnings. Also in the Appalachian Mountains today, we are going to be seeing cold temperatures this morning that will get down to that freezing mark. So that's how things are starting off. And here's the major features I'm watching in the near term. First, we've been discussing all week about some inconsistency we've seen in the GFS model. In the most, well, last 48 hours or so, we've really seen the GFS model in the near term fall right in line with the European model solution. So throughout much of this video, I will be focusing on what the European model has been saying about the upcoming pattern. Here's the difference. The GFS has been much more progressive with the pattern, meaning that it's moving at much more quickly to the east than the European model has been doing. And next week, the difference in those patterns is enormous. You'll see it in a few moments. A couple of things I want to be worried about or thinking about for next week. We could be developing a coupled jet streak issue. I'll show it to you in a few moments. That just means great upper level divergence so that's support for big low pressure systems. Much of the eastern half of the country will be dealing with a large intrusion of 
colder air that we sweeping through by the time we get to ca uh, Halloween. And we do have a typhoon we need to be paying attention to that could disturb the flow for next week. So what I want to show you over here on the right animating is the European model. And here's the main features we're going to be watching between Thursday this evening and getting into Friday morning. You see that upper level low sitting here does cut off from the flow of the jet stream. And as it gets cut off, what it means is it slows it down. It's able to draw more moisture out ahead of it as the jet stream bridges over the northern side of this. Therefore, by Friday evening getting into Saturday and Saturday evening, that low barely moves into um, you know parts of Missouri. Now reloading behind it, we have another positively tilted trough. That's one where as you look more north, the leading edge of the trough is more farther to the east. And those types of troughs tend to dig. And so what do we notice? It digs into California. It then sweeps through the four corner states. See this little short wave here? That little short wave then wraps around the upper level low by next Tuesday. And this produces a situation where we have a coupled jet streak a lot of, along with a lot of curvature dynamics that produces great upper level support for the development of a, a sizable low here in the midsection of the United States. We're watching again next Tuesday into Wednesday. Well, that trough barrels on through by Wednesday into Thursday. So it digs first and then lifts by Thursday and Friday of next week. And the operational European model run, along with the GFS actually, want to bring in some pretty substantially cold air in behind that. We notice we keep building big ridges along the west coast of North America and the Gulf of Alaska. Therefore, the pattern out west is going to remain on the drier side of things. So let's now break this down and see what it means. Starting first with our high resolution model, let's just play this out through early this morning. You saw the snow in the overnight hours right here in southern parts of Colorado, but you'll notice that as this new low develops, it produces a precipitation shield early this morning that stretches through Oklahoma, parts of Arkansas, and into Missouri. But on the back side of this, where there's enough cold air, we could be seeing some snowflakes flying here like in and around Amarillo getting back over into parts of eastern New Mexico. Now, and through this quarter, some potentially very heavy rainfall throughout the day today into this evening and the overnight hours. As this cutoff low slowly progresses, I've got you all about to next five uh, tomorrow at five to eight o'clock in the morning here. As it slowly progresses through midday tomorrow here toward the lower Mississippi River Valley. So we could potentially get quite a bit of heavy rain with this system as we get through the day on Friday and into early Saturday morning. So that's where we get by early Saturday morning. Adding all this rainfall up, this is what we're seeing from our high resolution NAM model. Potentially quite a bit of rainfall out ahead of the system as it cuts off and is able to draw a lot more moisture into it as it spins here through uh, south central United States into the lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, what I want to do next is take you from Saturday morning through next Tuesday morning, and we're going to do a multi-model analysis, GFS on the left, European on the right. Now look at the differences between the two models. The GFS being much more progressive with this system brings rainfall to the southeast quicker and through the eastern Corn Belt and the Ohio River Valley much quicker. Uh, the European model delays this a bit and brings this rainfall later. And you notice right over in this corridor, we don't have the precipitation quite yet, the heavy stuff, as we progress into Tuesday morning. Also, with the next system that follows, wow, the European bring in more precipitation into the central United States, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa, where it is not there in the GFS. And that's an important difference we're going to talk about in a few moments. Now, let me take you from Tuesday morning to Friday morning. You see, at that time, the GFS wants to very quickly progress a trough into this area, sweep in cold air, and dry everything out. The European model, not having it. It's stalling out an upper level trough that slowly sweeps through this area, developing a large low pressure system. And look at the differences in precipitation. Just stop, pause the video if you have to, and look at the differences we have in our operational model runs for next Tuesday through next Friday morning. It is substantial, and we need to see why there are those differences. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up into the upper levels of the atmosphere and look at spin or vorticity. Now, I apologize. I didn't notice that I did this, but now the European is on the left and the GFS is on the right. These two models are in pretty darn good agreement up to this point, out to about Friday afternoon with where this trough is going to be. You can see they both have it here over the Texas and Oklahoma border. But watch what happens as I put you through, through early Saturday, uh, through midday Saturday. This is where the difference in the speed really shows up. 
the European model, keeping the upper level trough sitting here. This is where our, uh, our little cutoff low is. And look, the GFS already bringing it through Illinois. So we're already off by a few hundred miles here. Now, with these vorticity maxima, you always want to look, look at the image over here on the left with me. You always want to look just downstream right here for the best, best development of low pressure. And what we see is going through Saturday into Sunday, this is Sunday around 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, the European has that trough sitting here just to the east of Michigan. The GFS has already got it way off into parts of, uh, of Quebec, okay? And at that point, the next trough is sweeping through and this is where the big differences really come in. So let's just get you all the way out to next, let's call it Monday morning. At this point, the European is allowing this trough to hang around kind of over the Mojave Desert. The GFS already has it sweeping through New Mexico. Now with that, getting out to next Tuesday morning, let's go right here. Look at the difference. The European keeping this broader trough swept in through this area back here in the Intermountain West through the Central Plains. The GFS already has it coming through Illinois. That sweeps through quicker, brings in the drier air quicker, and what does the European model do? Well, instead of sweeping uh, the trough through like the GFS does, look, it's all the way up here in Canada, Eastern Canada. The European has this feature sitting right here through parts of New, uh, New Mexico and Texas, and then building into a deep low pressure system here in the middle part of the country. These two models couldn't be farther apart in the progression of this next system. And this is the end result. I'm gonna put the GFS back on the left now, European over here on the right. What happens? The GFS sweeps in by next Tuesday evening. Big area of higher atmospheric pressure that sweeps in a big cold front that gets all the way down here to the southeast. What's going on with the European model? With the slower upper level feature, it has got the trough sitting here, low pressure in that area, and the cold air is still way back in this area advancing forward. It's all about the timing of these next few systems. The GFS wants to clean everything out quickly. The European, much slower progression. And here's the result. Looking at the ensemble forecast, day four through 10. So now again, we're looking, starting at the end of this week and getting through next week. GFS on the left, European on the right. With the much quicker progression of the systems, much drier. The European, look at the differences in precipitation patterns. It is substantially wetter for the eastern half of the United States. Where these two models agree is on the west coast in the northwest. They're both dry in that area because it, both models are bringing in this big ridge that's sitting here in the Gulf of Alaska. So that's maybe the one place where they agree. But if you're east of the Rocky Mountains, major model disagreement at this point due to the speed of the next system coming through next week. Now the GFS Ensemble is a different uh, setup and scheme than the GFS Operational. And the GFS Ensemble, which I'm showing you here, looking at the probability of picking up three inches of snow through the next 10 days, well, yes, down the spine of the Rocky Mountains. But this corridor in through here is something we're going to be watching not only today in this area, but next week right in through here. I want to just keep an eye on it, let you know that we need to be watching this in each weather forecast video that we produce. It's a critical piece I don't want you to forget about because if the model ensembles are right with the timing of this system coming through next week, we could be getting some snow know on the cold air that's on the back side of it. Now disrupting the flow once we get deep into week two is uh, uh, Bois-Loy, I think is how you say it. It is this typhoon sitting here. Its current position has it moving over the next seven days getting absorbed into the jet stream flow. This is going to reduce predictability in the longer term. So over the next five days, we are going to be watching for the pattern to become highly amplified, you know, doing something a bit like this. Warmth over the southeast, warmth over California, very dry. But with the troughs that are digging in, we're talking some cooler air. Now, remember, we will get some reprieve from the colder air coming off the front range of the Rocky Mountains because we are going to get that uh, westerly wind warming things up temporarily. But we do notice that both models agree on a pretty sizable cold air intrusion coming through in the 6 to 10 day time period. And again, uh, the GFS is much more progressive, bringing it much farther toward the south and east at a much greater pace than the European, but both of the models have that cold air coming through. Now, 
looking out at the 11 to 15 day, we actually see colors kind of washed out here a bit. And that's because over that time period, both of our model, uh, main major modeling groups, the GFS and the European and their ensembles, tend to wash out the solution. There's quite a bit of spread. So we're losing our predictability and it's partly messed up by uh, the, the typhoon that's getting absorbed into the jet stream flow. But in the next 10 days, well, you just saw what we're gonna expect here in terms of temperature patterns, okay? So just to show you what the overnight low temperatures are going to look like, this is from the National Blended Model. Let me just step you back here. Here's Thursday morning's lows and Friday morning lows. That's the first system sweeping through. We notice that as that one gets east on Saturday, we start to get a little bit of a rebound in our temperatures in the midsection of the country. But you'll notice by Sunday into Monday and Tuesday, as the next trough becomes established, very cold air sitting in the northern part of the United States that is sweeping south by Wednesday and into Thursday. That's Thursday morning lows. Here's Friday morning lows. So when you look at this, if you're not in the southeast or in the deep south here or getting into the west coast, this is going to be a very chilly Halloween. I know I have a lot of kids that watch my videos, and I'm just going to tell you, kids, make sure that you choose the right costume uh, because it looks as though we're going to be doing some pretty chilly trick-or-treating by the time we get out to uh, the 31st here. All right? To finish this up, I want to talk about some global features we need to be paying attention to. I addressed all of this in my long-range update. You need to watch that. Please watch that. I released it yesterday. Something I want to be thinking more about is I want to be thinking about this region. Now, we know that the Indian Ocean Dipole event has been the strongest driver of our tropical climate dynamics recently. It's been sending a pretty strong easterly wind here and a westerly wind in this direction. And what that's done is it's really kind of changed what's going on across our El Nino region, which I'll just label EL here, all right? Now, you notice down here in this animation, which is showing you ocean temperature anomalies looking down deep into the ocean, that, uh, remember, this is lined up something like this, that in this corridor, we're bringing in some warmer water that is surfacing here, warming things up across this area in the near term. We've already seen the atmosphere behaving more like El Nino. And when we combine that with the warm water in the North Atlantic, I'm concerned about what that's going to do to the strength of I'm sorry, North Pacific. I'm concerned about what that's going to do to the strength of the subtropical jet stream where I just drew that arrow as we get into the month of November. But I addressed that in the long range updates. What we want to do in this one is talk about what that does to South America. We have noticed that this particular corridor has been relatively dry to start their growing season. It's been much wetter and it is forecast to be much wetter down here in parts of Paraná and uh, Uruguay and northeastern Argentina. But we've noticed that this year has been a delay compared to a year ago in planting progress. And in some regions, it's actually been some of the slowest planting progress in the last five years. And just looking at those recent precipitation anomalies, on the left, I have total accumulated precipitation from September 15th up until yesterday. And on the right, I have precipitation anomalies over that time period. It has been wet down here uh, in parts of Uruguay and Parana, southern Parana, but getting up into Rio Grande do Sol, Mato Grosso do Sol, and even getting up here into parts of southern Mato Grosso, we are drier than average, but we need to look at the amounts because what we really need to see over this time period is about four plus inches of rainfall. That would be ideal. And we can see that there have been some pockets in there that have been getting that. Again, this is a delay on the planting of first crop soybeans. That's not going to impact first crop soybean uh, production. That's more of a feature we have to be watching in early January through February. But this does mean this could put some pressure on that safrina crop, that second planted crop. Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to wrap up this forecast video. Thank you for giving me your attention this morning. I hope you all have a great day and we'll talk to you again with all of our forecast videos. Got some more coming out tomorrow on Friday, but more next week. Talk to you then. Thank you.